car. So I asked my friend Pete Muldoon, a uh, graduate of uh, uh, UDC, no, no and no. how weird. Um, <laughs> and we're uh, going to do, oh, you know, Judy Ledbetter, better known as Lead Belly, uh, visited Washington during Franklin Delano Roosevelt's administration uh, to sing at the White House. And uh, he made some discoveries uh, about Washington, D.C., and put them down in the words of this song. Um, but we're going to change his original uh, chorus toward the end to we need statehood now, we need statehood now. We're going to spread the news all around. But we're going to start with the original. And um, Pete, if you would set us up in the key of E. Listen to me, you yeah, don't you call up on the home down in Washington, D.C. Cause it's a bourgeois town. It's a bourgeois town. I got the bourgeois blues. I'm going to spread the news all around. You know, I don't see your lips moving. So uh, I'm going to try that again. And uh, this time I want you to echo me on it's a bourgeois town. Okay. It's a bourgeois town. It's a bourgeois town. It's a bourgeois town. It's a bourgeois blues. I'm going to spread the news all around. Look at your people, won't you? Listen to me, you don't you? Find a home down in Washington, D.C. It's a bourgeois town. It's a bourgeois town. It's a bourgeois town. It's a bourgeois town. You know, you all are coming in on a delay. We can't do it. <laughs> yeah, we know. You know that, 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 like, you know. But we're going we to try another verse. Well, it's the home of the brave and the land of the free. I don't want to be mistreated by no bourgeoisie, but it's a bourgeois town. It's a bourgeois town. It's a bourgeois town. The bourgeois blues are going to spread the news all around. And for the things that I cannot say publicly. I still haven't given up 
on getting our final panelists to join. But in the meantime, we will um, just forge ahead, folks. Um, all right, let us uh, start with Derek Musgrove. Derek, please explain to us why Julius Hobson is considered a statehood pioneer. Hmm. Well, it's, it's real simple. Uh, Julius Hobson, more than any other person in the 1970s, brings statehood uh, into the realm of respectable conversation. Um, when, most, when most DC residents before the 1970s, when they talked about gaining our rights, particularly a, a vote in Congress, they talked about things like retrocession, they talked about an amendment to the constitution that would have DC treated as though it were a state, but they really never talked about statehood. I mean, the first group of people to talk seriously about statehood in the post-World War II period were a bunch of black power activists who formed the statehood committee in 1969. And they never really followed up on the actual formation of the committee. It's really Julius Hobson who takes that idea um, and decides that when the city has its non-voting delegate election in 1971, he actually wants to put a um, referendum on the ballot during that election that says, we don't actually want this non-voting delegate position. We don't wanna sort of rearrange the deck chairs and just have a different type of colonialism. We want full on independence and equality. We want statehood, right? Um, now, you can't put a referendum on the ballot when elections already been called. He realizes that. And so he and other people that he's working with, most of them anti-freeway activists, people like Sam Smith, the crusading journalist, they say, OK, fine, since we can't put a referendum on the ballot, we're going to run Julius Hobson for non-voting delegate. And then he's going to go to the floor of Congress and advocate for statehood there. Um, he loses that election to Walter Fauntroy, uh, and we go ahead with the idea of pushing for a DC voting rights amendment for most of the 70s. But for the entire rest of the 70s until his untimely passing in 1977, uh, Julius Hobson is demanding that people take seriously the idea of statehood. So he's getting his allies in the House of Representatives to introduce statehood legislation. He's getting his allies in the Senate to introduce statehood legislation, both of which fail, but they get the idea on the radar he even gets the city council, uh, the DC council at the time in 1976, to um, have a vote on whether or not it wants to hold a statehood uh, constitutional convention. Um, that vote fails too. But again, he's able to get many of his colleagues on record talking about statehood. And Julius Hobson, for those of you who know much about him, was a uh, notoriously angry and unsatisfied individual. Um, he actually thrived on, on, on his own anger. And by the time that we get to 1976, when his statehood uh, bill fails before the council, he says, look, what we've done over the past seven years by founding the statehood party, by having all of these conversations about statehood, is that we have made the issue of statehood respectable. Um, and come to find out, um, you know, 50 years after his passing, uh, not only is statehood respectable, but it is the chosen strategy of this city, and it has a very good opportunity, perhaps better than any other time in the history of the city, of making it through to Congress uh, in the coming year. Thank you, Derek. And I'm sorry, I was just getting Carolyn Nicholas on the line, and she is with me. We're going to have to we're going to use old-fashioned technology <laughs> here. <laughs> so, Carolyn, okay. So, um, I am going to ask you to tell us uh, why Hilda Mason, your mother, and by the way, um, hang on one minute while I introduce Carolyn, because I didn't get a chance to introduce her to you. So let me read uh, <clears throat> a little background about her. So um, Carolyn uh, is the daughter of Hilda Helen M. Mason. And let me show you a picture of her. So you guys um, 
can see what she looks like. There you go. That is Miss Carolyn Nicholas. Okay, and let me read <clears throat> a little bio. Um, Ms. Nicholas graduated from DC Public Schools, earned a Bachelor of Arts in Spanish and Government at Howard University and a Master's of Public Administration from the American University. She worked for 26 years for the DC government in the healthcare field and is now retired. Since her mother's death, she has dedicated her life to the issue of the neglect, abuse, and financial exploitation of DC seniors through her work at the Hilda and Charles Mason Charitable Foundation. The DC Office of Aging awarded her the Elder Abuse Prevention Award for 2018, and she was nominated for the Excellence in Aging Services Award for 2019. She authored a book titled Hilda, and she will tell us more about her mother the famous Hilda Mason. So, um, Carolyn, uh, what we would like to uh, ask you first is to explain um, how your mother or why your mother is considered to be a statehood pioneer. And I'm going to I'm going to put the phone up to my computer so that folks can hear you. And in the meantime, um, and while you're speaking, I'll share my screen and I'll show uh, folks the slideshow, okay? So one, two, three, you're on. Uh-oh. Hang on, one minute, hang on. Start, start one, I'm gonna put you on speaker so folks can hear. Go ahead, Carolyn. Began her career as an educator. While establishing a reputation as a leader in the field of education, Hilda also made a crucial impact outside the classroom, helping to organize the Washington Teachers Union in her school and fighting for the equal rights and equal treatment for the Negro. As Hilda's involvement in community issues grew, she was urged to run for the DC Board of Education by Julia Thompson the city's most dynamic and progressive civil rights and education activist. She had worked with Thompson on a number of matters, including his successful landmark lawsuit on the unequal treatment of black students in the DC public schools. Thompson was running for a seat on the DC Council and wanted Hilda to run for his seat on the Board of Education. Charlie supported the idea. Hilda ran and was elected to represent Ward 4 on the DC Board of Education in 1971. Hilda was re-elected to the Board of Education in 1975. At the same time that Hilda was beginning her work on the DC Board of Education, Julia Thompson and others were organizing the statehood party. Since Charlie and Hilda strongly supported statehood in the District of Columbia, they joined the new statehood party. Representing the statehood party, Julia Thompson was elected and large member of the D.C. Council in the 1974 election. When Hobson died in office in 1977, Hilda was chosen by the Freedom Party to succeed him. In July 1977, immediately upon joining the council, Hilda led a successful fight for passage of a bill that Hobson had introduced before his death, Bill 2-1. District of Columbia Statehood Act, asserting that the Home Rule government granted to the District of Columbia by the Congress with its provision for con congressional veto was not self-determination because it left the local government free to manage its own affairs only to the extent that it did not alienate either the Congress or the President. Hilda predicted that congressional delay and interference, especially in budget matters, would continue to be the fact of life to the Home Rule government. After completing Hobson's term, Hilda won the at-large seat in her own right in 1978 for a full term, but her consistent support for legislation to address the needs of business consumers rather than the interests of the business community that many in the business community do conclude that she considered the consumer her only constituency. The DC Democratic State Committee and Democratic political leaders continue to support her because they consider her a Democrat and business community before she completed her first full term. Still, the never went on to be re-elected to the FRC in 1983, 1990, 
Court, tangibly defeating the rare threat of he received for the state of party nomination, and then relying on the people for a goodwill among voters across the city to carry her in the general election. In the matter of staying in office, she benefited from a provision of the D.C. Home Rule Charter that prohibits a party from holding more than three of the five at-large council seats, including that of chairman. On August 22, 1978, Congress passed a proposed constitutional amendment to give the District of Columbia voting representation in the Congress. The amendment let, had to be ratified by at least 28 state legislatures within seven years to become effective. Hilda opposed the proposed amendment on the grounds that it would not change the relationship between the D.C. government and the Congress, who she insisted would continue to exercise the power. Cash, is anything being said now? We aren't hearing anything. Oh. Bring you so. Yes, you there you go. There oh, you go. There you go. That's what happened. Oh, oh, Lord. What? Okay, I know the problem. Okay. What? Um, can you maybe give just like a a quick summary of that for the next couple of minutes, Carolyn. I The problem was that I had muted my microphone. Yeah, just the last few minutes, if you can it's, it's repeat. The last, the last, uh, the last bit that, that you said. About the effort to, to get uh, statehood uh, constitution approved and, and the, the failure. Right. Uh, up until 1993, uh, Hilda was involved in, in trying to uh, Yes, D.C. approved uh, a state, admitted to the Union as the 51st state. But uh, as we all know, that was never successful. Gotcha. So we're, we're still waiting. <laughs> yes, we are. Thank you so much. And I'm so sorry about um, about muting you. Uh, OK, so we will We It sounds like this technique does work. So please stay on hand for, for the next question, Carolyn, if you okay. mind, in, 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 a, in a while. OK, okay. thanks so they much. Did anything I said? Yes, yes, they did. It was only the last bit that I cut you off on. So okay. the system's working. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for bearing with me. Um, OK, let's move on to Johnny. Uh, Johnny. Tell us about Walter Fontroy, who took a, a different road from, from the statehood pioneers, but still played a very important role in, in DC's history. Please tell us about him. Walter Fontroy uh, learned at the feet of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And as such, his politics were more pragmatic. He believed in Washington football. 10 yards at a time and move down the field rather than trying to throw a touchdown on one play. Uh, and, and that uh, view collided sometimes with others. Um, but the first thing the Congressman did was to work with Lyndon Johnson to get uh, a DC council uh, appointed by um, the president and uh, Ms. Fronte served as vice chairman. He then um, worked to help get an elected school board in 1968. He then uh, took a group of us down to South Carolina to get rid of Johnny McMillan, who was the chairman of the uh, DC committee uh, and was an obstructionist to all of our freedoms. Um, and um, he supported a young man down there who beat Johnny McMillan and they danced in the street saying, Johnny Mac ain't coming back. Uh, and so that paved the way for home rule. We got the uh, home rule. I remember President Nixon signed the bill on New Year's Eve. I know because I was working, we produced the pamphlet to explain to people what home rule was all about. 
And uh, then we elected our first uh, uh, local government with the mayor and 13 member council. Uh, from there, the congressman started working on the DC Voting Rights Amendment. And we were able to get uh, two thirds of the House supermajority and two thirds of the Senate to pass the DC Voting Rights Amendment. It failed when it went to the states because we needed 38 states, just like the Equal Rights Amendment. After that, Congressman Fontroy introduced the first HR 51 DC statehood bill. And so he, much of his work laid the foundation for the introduction, introduction of DC statehood and which brings us to, to today that we're um, on the precipice of, uh, of, of gaining statehood if the Democrats um, don't mess it up. Um, and so um, I would say that uh, his work as a pragmatist uh, was important to laying the foundation for the work that everybody else, so many are doing today. And, and it paved the way. One of the things he did when we got the DC Voting Rights Amendment passed was to get the first Republican, uh, John Buchanan of Alabama to co-sponsor the bill. And then by the time we went to the Senate, we had eight Republican senators as co-sponsors. And so we need to get one Republican, that's all we need. And statehood will sell through the Congress. Uh, Jim Wright, who was a speaker at the time, went to the floor of the House and praised the work of Congressman Fontroy uh, because we couldn't use the ordinary whip system. We had to create our own whip system. So Walter Fontroy, using the techniques of Dr. Martin Luther King, laid the foundation for today's statehood movement. Thank you, Thank so, you much, so much, Johnny. Okay, let's move on to Michelle. Tingling Clemens, Michelle, tell us about how Josephine Butler, whom you knew personally, came to be a statehood pioneer. Well, <clears throat> ooh, sorry. Um, hi, evening, everybody. Uh, Joe Butler uh, originally came to DC from Brandywine area of Maryland. And uh, she was the, the child of sharecroppers who had also, who were, the, who were who themselves the children of, of, of some of the formerly enslaved. Um, she also, but so she, when she got here, she went to work for a laundry. She had to lie about her age because she wasn't but 14, but she worked there. That was in the thirties that she worked in the laundry. And by the forties, she got, she was uh, very active in organizing laundry workers. Um, and, uh, then, I mean, but Joe Butler's history is just a history of somebody who was active in organizing workers where she was. Uh, fighting for peace and justice uh, and environmentalism. And one thing about Joe, my husband was describing her to somebody earlier today. She was, she was, a, she was about a, a middle height, brown skinned woman. But if you saw her, the thing that you would have noticed is that she was wearing a tam and it was covered with buttons. Every political event that had happened since the last time you'd seen her, plus a few that you'd missed. And then, you know, most people carry them on their coat. Joe carried them on her head. And we never did figure out how, because that's really heavy way to carry buttons around. But, um, you know, Josephine was really uh, very innovative in the work that she did. I actually met her my first day in Washington because I was working for an environmental organization was in the basement of the DC Lung Association. And so uh, they were, and when I came into the office, the director was introducing me around. And then they said, you know, like, and over here we have our, um, uh, out school outreach and environment coordinator. And then the wall popped open and Joe Butler stepped out. You know, you would think that it had been choreographed. But, so when I looked inside that office, it actually had been a closet, but she had, it had been retrofitted and Joe had brochures all around them and, and all kinds of educational material. She asked me if I had a minute and, and then she taught me about DC statehood. And that was the beginning of my sojourn in Washington which I moved here in 1977 from New York City. So, but I was really offended when she told me about it because I'd been taught like a lot of people have that one of the rights that we had as citizens were the right to taxation without representation. And what I learned instead is that when I moved to DC and, this, and, and, and registered to vote here, I gave up my citizenship. And most people don't think of it like that. But if mm -hmm. I don't have a voice in the body 
that is making the laws we have to live under, I'm not a citizen. So Joe was one of the people who, who helped to, to, to school me to that. And she, from her, you know, from her picketing days, she'd been active in picketing Woolworths to integrate it. She taught us the chance. None of us, uh, uh, if none, wait, if one of us, none of us are free until all of us are free. So now she was teaching a little bit of English with that there too. And then I learned <laughs> later on that um, my, uh, so one of the things I did was because of that, I joined the statehood party when I first came to DC before I knew I was giving up my citizenship, but that's okay. I'm all right being a citizen in DC and fighting for what's right. Uh, but my husband was, I found out later that before, before we met, he was one of the people who used to go out with Joe Butler to talk in the schools about statehood. She visited schools all over the district because that's what she had been doing in her role as an environmental and, and youth coordinator uh, doing outreach for the DC Lung Association. And I also remember some of our, some of our younger children when they had school elections around, around election time, they actually had somebody running for the statehood positions and representing it in the schools. So I, so I could see both the impact of, of what was going on then and the lack of it now, because we have other children who've been in the schools and they don't even have mock elections. And if they do, pretty much assured that statehood is not on the bill. But Joe Butler, Joe Butler was a fierce advocate for um, democracy and she joined the statehood party in the very early days, because I'm sure she met Julius Hobson on some of the picket lines. And she was also somebody who was very fiercely determined to be about self-determination. She was an advocate for children. She was an advocate for the environment and she was an advocate for her adopted city. So I, I encourage all of you who don't know much about her to please look it up. And when you know stuff about her, add to it because I, when I started looking to see what public information was out there, I was really kind of pissed because there's not enough information about Joe Butler. You know, and when Joseph, I put in Josephine Butler, somebody, somebody white came up who lives in another part of the country and I forget what their profession is, but I knew it wasn't my Joe Butler. So, I mean, I think that that's, that's just an indication that we, those of us who know these, these heroes, we have to be active in helping to make sure that the information and their their legacy isn't lost. Uh, one of the last things is that Joe got us involved in the, this Paul Robeson Friendship Society that she'd been active in for years and was the chair of. And through that, we met activists from all over the world, but particularly the Soviet Union, who also wanted peace. And I found that was very useful to us in our, our other kinds of life and work because she was also a source for non-traditional information about issues that were of importance to us. Thank you so much, Michelle. Okay, and Anise, uh, you are Miss Statehood, uh, as everybody knows. So you're the one person on this panel who is here to talk about yourself because you are indeed a statehood pioneer. Um, tell us your story about uh, getting involved with the statehood movement, please. Yes, I'm very honored to be considered a statehood pioneer. I don't know if that really is true, but when I, I, I realized that after Michelle gave her presentation that Stand Up for Democracy was founded the year that um, Josephine uh, Butler passed, we were found in 1997, the year that the Congress took over by Lodge Faircloth, Senator Lodge Faircloth, the year that Congress took over DC government, took over the mayor's powers, took over the DC uh, school system powers, took over everything. But I just couldn't believe that was happening. As a graduate of Howard University Political Science Department, I had not been taught that we were such political slaves. And that's what DC called, um, Washington. that's what um, Stand Up called DC, the last plantation. And I think it has a lot to do with the fact that we were under, being used as political pawns, political slaves by the Congress of the United States of America. People would go and take the fact that they had DC citizens in their control, that they had the budget under their control, 
that they had everything that, that regular citizens had. Um, under, they would go back and campaign in their districts saying that we're controlling those people in DC. They can't do what they want to do. We have them under our thumb. And I was furious when I heard that was possible. I was very angry and stand up for democracy. First thing we did, we got into good trouble. We really enjoyed getting arrested, opposing the um, control board of D DC. The control board was created to control us and we would not be controlled. We went to the galleries of Congress, the Senate gallery, the House gallery and got arrested. And we looked forward to that, to opposing them. We would say, DC says no. We wouldn't have an official vote on the, the, um, the floor of the Congress. Our delegate could not vote for any of these laws that were passed, but we spoke out and yelled from the, the gallery of the Senate of the House that we said no. Um, I'm very proud of the people who joined us. Some of those people were Walter Fartroy. He would come to some of our meetings. We had the DC statehood delegation, which was founded in 1982, which included Charles Moreland, um, Julius Hobson, no Charles Moreland, um, Josephine, I'm sorry, Florence Pendleton and <clears throat> Jesse Jackson. He was the first um, DC statehood senator. And we had these very influential people including in, including in our meetings. They came to teach us what was right and what was wrong. We were determined to get attention to the issue of DC statehood by being arrested, facing six months in jail. We were never um, convicted except one time and I was never convicted. I was arrested nine times, very proud of it. I would go to court and the DC residents would not convict me. There was only one conviction and I was not involved in that um, group. They got, con one of the people got convicted. That was the only conviction that we had. DC residents knew that they were not considered regular American citizens. Michelle is right. We are not citizens until we get representation in the Congress, control of our local budget, control of our local affairs. We have uh, people who served in the military, such as uh, Rosie Caprice, who served in the military and has no right to determine Hello? whether we go to war or not. This is absolutely an insult. It's a total insult. And that's why we call DC the last plantation. Thank you, Anise. Thank you all for giving us a wonderful flavor of these five um, pioneers uh, in the statehood movement. Um, we got a kind of a pretty good sense of them. Maybe I can ask each of you um, to tell us a particular sort of story or episode about some of the campaigns that um, these folks worked in. Um, it could be, you know, any of the sort of activist campaigns that they were involved with. Michelle, let's start with you. Um, Joe Butler was involved with so many, so many efforts, environment, uh, issues among others. Um, any particular episode or story that you'd like to share? Michelle, let's make sure that you're unmuted. Sorry, there we I, go. I forgot. No problem. Okay, um, no, I was saying that you're right. Joe was involved in a lot of things, which is, I kept bumping into her in a lot of different places because we were also all members of the Hiroshima Nagasaki Peace Committee. So, and which, you know, of course, linked us up with Hilda Mason because Hilda actually was the council member who got past the, uh, the, the Nuclear Free DC Act. So that, you know, nuclear materials are not supposed to be housed and stored in DC. She did that through the council. Um, but, uh, 
But Joe, I mean, I, I remember that Joe, and I hadn't realized early on that Joe at, was very uh, active around pollution uh, and lung, lung challenges because she'd had tuberculosis in the 50s and, and gotten treated for it. And then she went and volunteered for the DC Lung Association so she could share the information she'd learned during her treatment and her life with children in schools. And then, so then they eventually, they hired her. And so uh, what I believe is that as she was in the schools, that she was not only doing, she was doing double the duty. She was telling people about uh, air pollution and their health, but she was also teaching them about statehood and their rights. So, I mean, I, the, one of the, I mean for me, the best story was her popping out of the wall was my favorite one. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, and also it was running into her, it was just running into her everywhere you know, showing up to the different programs that she, she organized. And she was very good about reaching out to and helping to uh, let people know that they were the ones whose, whose work this was because it was their idea. <laughs> Somehow she convinced you that it was your idea so that you could get out there and, and do a lot of the work with her and it wouldn't all be on her. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, we're gonna go to um, Carolyn. Carolyn, can you hear me? Carolyn? Yeah. Okay, great. Can you share with us um, a story about your mother, perhaps one of the campaigns that she was involved with or any kind of story um, from her life. And, you know, uh, I think I mentioned in the beginning, Carolyn wrote a book about her mother called Hilda. So um, please share a story with us. And I'm going to try to play that slideshow again that some folks missed out on. Okay. Okay. All right. Hilda had an extraordinary commitment to social justice and equality and was involved in every progressive cause. She always understood that public service was not an alternative to activism that you could do both, and both are equally important. Stories of her legendary generosity and legendary kindness, rectitude, courage, and determination, and ceaseless support for progressive issues, including human and civil rights and socioeconomic opportunities for the disadvantaged, abound. She and Charlie dedicated their lives to public service and to an unending struggle to improve life for the disadvantaged and the downtrodden. Theirs were lives well spent in untiring and dedicated efforts to assist those in need of affordable health care, affordable housing, accessible and affordable transportation, a quality education for all students, a living wage, equal rights, equal justice, and equal opportunities to bring about an international freeze on nuclear weapons, an international control of nuclear power, an end to all wars and world peace, and statehood for the District of Columbia. Hilda Mason was uh, often um, classified, I guess, or often called a, a, a politician, but she was not a politician. She was a community activist, and she was, she thought her raison d'etre was to help others. That was what she was brought up on uh, doing. That's what her parents did, and that's what she learned from her parents. She once said when asked what made her true to her principles, it's in the marrow of my bones, it's in my blood, almost every step I take. I feel like I'm doing what my mother and father would have done. Thank you, Carolyn. And uh, <laughs> my apologies um, for apparently not having mastered the art of screen sharing. I, I couldn't hear you. <laughs> not, not a problem. Um, okay, so. We're, you're fine, Carolyn. Folks were able, able to hear you. OK, Derek, tell us um, what, uh, tell us a story about the, the famous Julius Hobson, who sounds like quite a character um, from everything I've heard. Yes, to say the least. Um, well, I, I think what the, you know, the, the two panelists have spoken before me point out is that the statehood party and people associated with the statehood party were really interested in a very broad range of what we now call progressive issues. And so they were involved in school reform, police reform, before that desegregation when they were working with CORE and the NAACP. And so it's really hard to choose something with um, uh, Hobson. So I'm actually going to choose something that, that most, of, most people on here probably haven't heard about. And that was Hobson's last 
Um, victory, as far as passing a bill on the DC Council, was passing a bill that allowed for the um, uh, submission of referendums um, to, on, on the ballot. So, so before 1976 or 1977, um, act, actually the bill is passed in 76 or 77, it goes into effect in 1979. And before that time, un, under the Home Rule Charter, uh, citizens couldn't submit referendums in the city and have them voted up on the next ballot. Hobson essentially uh, submits his last bill that he gets passed through the council in order to do that. And the reason that's important, because it doesn't sound like something that would be of much interest to us today, but the reason that's important is because in 1980, uh, a little known member of the statehood party, who, who was actually pretty inactive within the party itself, a guy by the name of Ed Guinan, who was uh, really well known as an anti-poverty and anti-homelessness activist, used that bill that Hobson had put forward and put a statehood referendum on the DC ballot in 1980. And it's that referendum that essentially binds the city to the statehood strategy and makes it the official strategy of the city. Um, and that combined with the, the slow death of the DC Voting Rights Amendment, largely because new right activists out there in the States and Johnny Barnes can talk about this, but you know, people like Phyllis Schlafly and Pat Buchanan, really famous new right activists, poured all of this money and all of this energy into defeating the, the DC Voting Rights Amendment. And so as the DC Voting Rights Amendment is being bogged down in the States, you know, uh, Guinan is, is able to get the city essentially to adopt statehood. Um, and it's, it's in that five-year period between the passage of the statehood referendum and uh, the 1985 expiration of the DC Voting Rights Amendment when it's not ratified, that people like uh, Johnny, people like Walter Fontroy begin to pivot towards statehood. And you get these really seasoned, um, sharp activists who have been working for a vote in Congress for all these years and who I think legitimately um, did not think that statehood had a good um, a possibility of passing in Congress. And, and I think Johnny would argue that that's absolutely the case then. Um, but they, they converted to the statehood cause uh, because of that amendment um, and because of the failure of the DCVRA. And that brought all of this energy and all of this talent to the cause uh, over the course of the 1980s. Thank you. Okay, Johnny, um, is there a story about Walter Fontroy that you'd like to share with us? I don't wear coats in the winter. And as a follower of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the congressman believed very strongly in peaceful nonviolent protests, filled the West Lawn of the Capitol to get the King holiday bill passed. Um, but I remember in, in his his unwavering faith always um, in believing that uh, it could yeah, it could happen. And we, we were out in front of the South African embassy if, after he had been arrested on Thanksgiving Eve uh, that year. And, and I was in my thin Armani suit. I could wear Armani suits back then. And we're walking around in a circle chanting free Nelson Mandela. And I am, just, I'm a disbelief. I said, they're never going to free that man. Never, ever. And sure enough, they freed Nelson Mandela and Reagan signed the bill. Reagan signed the King holiday bill after he said he would never sign it because King was a communist, but he signed it. There's a way to get these people to do the right thing. And uh, Walter Fontray uh, had a good knack for being at the center of those uh, movements. Thank you, Johnny. And Anise, we'll finish up with you. Please share a favorite story of yours, uh, perhaps uh, about the dark days of the Financial Control Board. Yes, it was always a shock to see um, how the Congress controlled DC. At one time, if you all can recall, um, DC had the highest HIV AIDS rate in the country. And um, I must say, I didn't do all this protest by myself. There was a senator from Georgia, um, Bob Barr, who uh, prevented us 
from counting the um, petition signatures that we had uh, gathered for Clean Needle Exchange, he actually prevented the count by the DC Board of Elections by refusing to let DC spend its money for the count. And this is something incredible. I protested along with Karen Shogut and other people who yelled from <laughs> the gallery of the, the House of Representatives that we voted yes. We voted that DC would have a needle exchange program. And what was really stunning is Bob Barr ended up running for president on the libertarian ticket where he said he supported clean needle exchange. He just changed just like that. It didn't mean that much to him that people in DC were dying of HIV AIDS. Uh, yes, many, uh, many nasty characters in our, in our attempts uh, to exercise our self-control self here. Um, Okie dokie, we are getting ready to move on to our audience question and answers, but um, first we're gonna get a little artistic energy from Razi Caprice. Razi is going to sing Free My City. Take it away, Razi. Hey, Razi. Let me ring out this uh, MP3 for you guys. We can get started. Here we go. Yeah, my fellow Americans, District of Columbians, every nationality and faith, from Section A hood to statehood, no matter what party you're rooting for, join the movement. It's a DC thing, y'all. Free my city. Come on, free my city. Free now what we want, what's Stay good. good. Now what Stay we want, good. what's Stay good? good. Free my Stay city. Good. Free my good. city. Now what we Free want, DC. know what's good, Stay good. now what Stay we good. want. Stay hood. The white T says free DC. Every time I breathe, it's free DC. I feel like the modern day Francis Scott Key. Him seeing at your political party. So pardon me, y'all, for speaking awkwardly. Mama may lose her house due to this new monopoly. This fuel for property. So can we please review the policy? And if you're a lover of truth, then you'll acknowledge me. And if not, I guess I tie my own slip knot, huh? Man, y'all better march for me. If you feel this DC hip hop, just put your vote inside the ballot box and see whether yours gonna count or not. They build stadiums, make taxpayers pay for them, but repair miss for our schools, we gotta wait for them. And yet they wonder why the youth gotta hate for them, but it won't change so they make a candidate for them. It's taxation without representation, no star for us on the flat, we the last plantation. It take a rapper to do it, they won't say that. Lafayette Square and Landmark, where they so slaves that and still that rope upon us. We got no vote in Congress. We still second class citizens due to knowledge. Come on, free DC, free my city. Now what we want, or what's free good? Free DC. And what we want, or what's Stay good? Hood. Hey, Stay free hood. my city. Stay Come on, free my city. Now what we free want, DC. or what's good? Stay hood. Now what we want, Stay hood. what's good? Stay hood. Yeah. Stay we got hood. to overcome, or we shall overcome. It's for the people, by the people. I won't hold my tongue. It's for the dollar, by the dollar. Maybe still for some, but why? Citizens get sold while citizens get hung. Saying to vote for me, <laughs> I'll set you free. While corporations just pay them to sell us a dream. That could be your home that's being foreclosed. We've been standing strong since it was a war zone. Imagine paying rent the whole time you dream to own. But once it's up for sale, the landlord, they need you gone. No public health care for the public welfare. I bet DC General was still here. Is it they not aware? Or they just don't care. I say they both apply like Puffy said, vote or die. They want to free us on the streets or free us on the beat and see if we can make these politicians get up out their seat. They violate our rights with Patriot Acts. I think it's time we got statehood back. Put DC on the map. Free my city. Free DC. Free my city. Free now DC. Now what we want. Oh, what's Stay good? Hood. Now what Stay we want. Hood. 
Stay good. Stay free. My city. Free DC. Free my city. Free DC. Stay good. Stay good. Stay good. Stay good. Free my city. Free DC. Free my city. Free DC. Stay good. Stay good. Stay good. Stay good. Free DC. Free DC. Stay hood. Stay hood. Stay hood. Stay hood. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, well done, Rossi. That was fantastic. Thank awesome. you so yeah. much. I'm glad I was able to <laughs> probably put the music around it just now. <laughs> that was wonderful. All right. Thanks so much. Okay. Now we are going to get some questions from our wonderful audience. Uh, those of you who are joining on Zoom and have the chat feature, please type your questions in the chat. I know that some of you have started already, but um, go ahead and also please specify which panelist you'd like to answer your questions. That way, hopefully we can get some more questions in. And um, in the meantime, I'm gonna start while you do that, I'm gonna check out the couple of folks who are dialing by phone to see if they would like to ask a question. So I'm going to allow those folks to talk. Um, are the folks who are joining by phone, uh, do you guys have any questions? There's a phone number ending in 151 and one ending in 791. Any questions? I'll come back to you in a little bit if uh, and check again, okay? All right. Um, let's go ahead and see some of these questions in the chat. Okay. I saw one from, uh, I think Derek, uh, you already answered the question about archival materials. Um, that was an, an excellent one, thanks. I figured that was a good one for you. Um, Anna asks Johnny to talk more about uh, Fontroy's relationship with Martin Luther King. Mm. Okay, should I go ahead? Yes, please. Well, he first met Dr. King when he was a student in college. Dr. King uh, was not able to, was traveling through the South and was not able to stay in the hotels because they were segregated. So he stayed with Walter Fontroy in the dorm room and their relationship continued over the years. And Fontroy was one of the, um, uh, he was in the posse with uh, Abernathy and Andy Young and Jesse Jackson and C.T. Vivian and all those folks, Hosea Williams, who who learned uh, under Dr. King, and there we, and Dr. King happily came to D.C. in support of our efforts for uh, uh, self determination, home rule, and those uh, they marched together. Uh, Fontroy was actually his Washington representative, so they had a long, long range relationship. Both, of course, were uh, our pastors, and um, and they had that uh, that same. Um, it came from that same fabric. Thank you, Johnny. Now, don't be shy, folks. Please go ahead and, and type your uh, your questions in the chat. Okay, I see Mr. Chuck Hicks mm -hmm. has a question here. Great to see you, Chuck. And thank you again for coming up with this idea for uh, for this panel discussion. Okay, he has a question for each panelist. How do you plan to fight for statehood? All right, let's start with um, Michelle. Okay, hey, thanks Chuck. Uh, interesting, because one of the first conversations I ever had with Anise at a panel, but I mean, one of the things that, that I do is something similar to what I've been doing is I try to reach all of my contacts outside of DC and harangue them periodically about statehood and the fact that they're, while I'm not a citizen, they are, and they can do something to help 
to uh, change our situation because we need their representatives to be educated and supportive for our rights to participate. Uh, that's, I mean, that's one thing because a lot of us have relatives outside and all of us aren't native Washingtonians. Um, so that's one piece. I think the other thing is really the education piece. We really got to make sure that people are educated about the issue of statehood and about the, 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 the self-determination means that we decide what we want, not somebody else decides what's more convenient for them. So when people start, you know, trying to throw words like retrocession because they're polysyllables, and they think it makes them sound smart. We have to be able to, to advise them, you know, with facts that that's not smart and that we don't live in Maryland. You know, we have a place where we live and we already know that we've got more, a greater population than the state of Wyoming. Okay, so we've got a smaller land area, but look at our, our role in commerce and we are the seat of government. So there's no need for us to wait, you know, and also to understand that one of the reasons why our uh, self-determined rights have been denied is because, you know, a lot of people on the call, everybody remembers when it was Chocolate City, you know, but the truth is, is that because, and Anissa used to, used to use this when she was talking about statehood, about the legis legislators who talked about DC being too urban, too progressive, too black, you know, but it was really too black was the key. And now that there's a much greater realization of the, the, how this country was really founded and, 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 and raised on racism, that this is clearly a racist tactic. And if you look at the last several states that were uh, affirmed, you'll see that that's why they also had such a long wait to become approved as states because of their population being less white than the rest of them. So these are all, you know, these are all factors. And, and I think that there's a way to remind people, there are other people who should be outraged that we're, we're still fighting for taxation without, we're still fighting for reparation for all the taxes that we pay. So there's, anyway, there's a number of things, but I, th those are some of the things that I, I think of initially. You, you covered quite a bit. Do any of the other panelists have anything to add? I think that we should not underestimate the um, fact that race has a large part to play with the fact that we are not being treated as citizens. We are not being acknowledged as citizens who do all the, all the, other, all the things other citizens do, such as serve in the military, pay taxes. Um, a lot of that has to do with race and DC was founded. Actually, it was moved from Philadelphia to DC to the area because Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton made a deal to uh, move DC to where slavery was legal. So I think that goes, that was a long time ago, but I think that also is in the soil of the opposition to DC statehood, race. I'd like to make a comment. Okay, Carolyn would like to make a comment. I'd Go like ahead, Carolyn. That because DC is majority Democratic, that the other states do not want two more Democratic senators in the Congress. Yeah, I forgot that one. Thanks, Carolyn. Yep, absolutely. The partisan divide is, is a huge issue uh, in, in the way. Um, Can I say something, uh, Cash, on that point? Yes. I take, a, I take a slightly different view. Uh, Senator Kennedy, Ted Kennedy coined the phrase, the four twos, said, D.C. is too urban, too democratic, too liberal, and too black. I don't think that's true. I think that, um, that you can guilt trip some of these folks, especially those who appreciate the history of this country. And, and the fact that there are black people in D.C. Uh, helps. Um, Strom Thurmond supported the D.C. Voting Rights Amendment because uh, uh, the black folks in South Carolina told him to. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that uh, um, the, uh, the the Senator Kennedy, who was who was the champion for us on D.C. voting rights, stated everything. I think he was. I think it was wrong on that about the two black part. I think more than anything, the two Democratic. And that's why we should now that we have the House and the Senate and the presidency run that thing through. Jim Wright and, um, and Jimmy Carter, they were going to do it, but they waited too long because uh, 
Newt Gingrich got Jim Wright out of there as speaker. So uh, we need to run it or we need to get one Republican. And, and maybe that's our senator from Utah whose father walked a march with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. What about the other yes. that has to be voted on by the state? Um, it doesn't have to be. Yeah, yeah. Johnny, you want to answer that? Well, DC statehood takes a simple majority. Um, you know, huh? In the in the Congress, the states have no role in uh, DC statehood. They had a role in the DC Voting Rights Amendment. That's why we had to get 38 states. But statehood is a simple vote in the House, a simple vote in the Senate, and signed by the president by cameralism and presentment. And we we're a state. We're so, so close, and the Democrats need to do that next week. Thanks for clarifying that, Johnny. Yes, thank and you, Johnny. Hi, there's, Johnny. A, there's a question Hi. for Anise from Betty, who asks, uh, are you hopeful that statehood could happen in the near future? Yes, I'm like Jesse Jackson. I keep hope alive. We've been working very hard for statehood. I believe that's Betty Hoover from the American Friends Service Committee who helped teach us and train us on nonviolent direct action. Betty, I do believe it's going to happen. I'm, no, I'm not questionable about it. I'm not uh, hesitant about saying that I think it's going to happen. I know you remember when we were out there talking about statehood and people were looking at us like we were crazy. We've got a lot of people who have joined us, a lot of people who have gotten behind this movement, and it's time. It's time for it to happen. Thank you, Anise. Okay, Jesse Lovell is asking if anybody would like to reflect on the days leading up to the DC VRA vote in the House and Senate. What do you most remember? Was it a real struggle to get bipartisan support? I'm thinking that maybe Derek or Johnny might be best to answer that question. Who would like to start? Johnny, you want go to go ahead, Derek? Question? Okay. Um, so what fascinates me about the, the DC Voting Rights Amendment is that it's really at this fulcrum in post-World War II struggles for DC self-determination. Coming out of World War II, both political parties are on record that they support an increase in DC self-determination. Now they're only talking about bringing the suffrage back, allowing people to vote for something. But by the time you get to the late 1950s, both parties are on record as supporting home rule and congressional representation. And by 1976, specifically both parties are saying we support the DC Voting Rights Amendment in their party platforms. Right now, the problem that both parties have, even though they have this bipartisan consensus that the status quo in DC is, is untenable, is that segregationists in particular, but also some conservative Republicans are blocking reform. And so they're the chairs of certain committees and they just won't let bills go forward. So what you get between the end of World War II and 1978 is this incremental reform, right? First in 1955, you get a bill that says DC residents can vote in primary elections for president. Then in 1960, you get the 23rd amendment which says DC residents can vote for president. Then you get the school board elections in 68, then non-voting delegate in 70, then home rule in 1971. All of those, by the way, are very hard fought, but you see that this opposition is, is, is you know, keeping people from getting to their goal, which is full self-determination. And the DC Voting Rights Amendment was, was you know, really the next step in that process. The idea is that we've got home rule with the bicentennial coming up, we can push the nation in this bipartisan group that has been backing uh, DC self-determination to give us representation in Congress as though we were a state. And so it's really the last time that there's bipartisan support for a major bill to increase DC self-determination. What happens is that the new right, these are sort of like the, the, the hardcore right-wing Republicans that eventually come to take over the party through the Reagan presidency, through Newt Gingrich's Republican revolution, and then through the Trump phenomenon, right? And those people are just stone cold partisans. They don't care what's just, 
They don't care what's important for American citizens. They want to win and they want to stay in control, even if it means disfranchising huge groups of people or keeping them disfranchised. And so you see this pivot point. The same people that organized to kill the DC Voting Rights Amendment then turn around and take over the Republican Party. And on every major piece of legislation after 1980, you get one Republican supporting it, you get two Republicans supporting it, but generally you get uniform Republican opposition. Um, and it's because the new right took over the Democratic Party, I mean, the Republican Party. And so all this talk about bipartisanship, it was a real thing that occurred before the mid 1970s. But then the GOP decided that their control of the government was more important than American democracy. Mm. Yeah, that was a pretty seismic shift in our politics. Um, I'm going to go to some of the questions in the Q&A panel. Um, there are a bunch there. Uh, Melissa asks, what lessons learned and approaches to organizing from these pioneers can we bring to this current fight for statehood? Anybody want to take a crack at that one? Yeah. Uh, this is Michelle. Uh, oh, I'm going to say what we tried telling the, the statehood Green Party until we realized that they didn't have much interest in statehood, but much more in running somebody for office. Uh, that what you have to do is step up to what the issues are of the people in the community where you are. And because there has to be, you have to have a relationship with people in order for them to trust you. And the thing is, as statehood, as statehood activists, we have a responsibility to, to be active in the communities where we are so that people recognize that the work that we do, when we talk about statehood, that it's been bolstered by the, the social justice work that we're doing in our communities. And that it's not just that people's needs and, and, and rights are not just an afterthought and that this isn't just you know, talking heads, but that in fact, statehood is a, is a critical component and whether you believe that this country is going to do the right things by us or now, we have a right to be participants. We have a right to be able to be players in that. And I think that the key is that we have a, we have a, a right and a responsibility to become actors in our own self-determination. And, state, and statehood is one of the first steps toward us getting that. So that's my point. Yes, I would, I would just like to say that uh, Stand Up for Democracy has a website, which is www.freedc.org. And on that website, we are asking people um, to, if they live in the states that we have listed, which is Wyoming, Arizona, and I know there's another state, but please go to the website. North and North. we're asking the Republicans who voted for, for um, impeachment to vote for DC statehood. Obviously, they believe in the constitution that um, the president violated the constitution. Um, and we're saying get maybe one or two of these Republicans to step across the uh, partisan line and to vote for statehood, which is um, uh, part of the constitution ta taxation without representation. We would like people to put pressure uh, on their relatives that live in those particular states to get their, their uh, senators to vote for DC statehood. They were brave enough to oppose their uh, tyrannical president. They, they might be brave enough to vote for DC statehood. Uh, I'm sorry, Kesh, can I just add one more thing? I think that one of the major strategies that, that uh, has been being slept of late is taking the issue to the schools and educating our coming generations about the importance of statehood, about their rights as citizens, because it's their rights that are, gonna, are the most being the most abridged by this uh, colonial status that we're in. Thank you. Um, We'll take one last question and I can't resist this one. I see Tina Hobson, who is Julius Hobson's wife, uh, wanting to ask uh, George, 
uh, to expand on his comments about the passing of Julius's last bill on the council uh, and how it helps us with statehood today. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, Derek, would you like to answer that? Sure, I'm, I'm honored. I'm honored that it, it's being asked. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you, Mrs. Hobson. Um, you know, today it, it it doesn't have much effect, but at in 1980 it had a really profound effect because Ed Guinan takes the machinery that that Julius Hobson had created through his bill that he got passed through the council and says, "I am going to put a referendum on the ballot." And once the citizenry in the general election of 1980 uh, adopted that referendum with, I think, around 58% of the vote at the time, some, somewhere, give or take, um, effectively, from that moment forward, we get put on automatic pilot uh, towards, you know, sort of a, a strategy of adopting statehood. Because once a referendum is passed, it requires that the city do a couple of things, which we've all done since, which is um, elect people to a constitutional convention, write up a constitution. All of that was done in 1982. Send that constitution to the Congress for consideration of admitting DC as a state. And then the last thing that it required, which the, 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 the council actually did not do for 10 years, was uh, required the election of um, a shadow delegation to Congress. And the council didn't do it because they figured there's no clear, you know, sort of uh, uh, job description for these positions. And they're going to cost about a million bucks. We don't have a lot of money. And so let's just not fund the elections. And so that's what the council did for 10 years. It just didn't fund elections of a shadow delegation. And then Jesse Jackson came to town in 1989 and was looking for a job, essentially. Um, and looking for a great cause that he thought could expand the scope of American democracy. And he, he was advised to run for shadow senator. He had actually thought about running for mayor and his advisor said, no, don't do that. Everyone will hate you. Um, and so he ran for shadow senator and he made it part of a national campaign to expand the scope of American democracy. Um, he, of course, served uh, as shadow senator until 1996. And during that time in the lead up to the 1993 statehood vote is able to get 31 Democratic co-sponsors on Edward Kennedy's statehood bill. Um, and so it pulls Jesse Jackson in a very formal way. But without that referendum bill that, that Julius Hobson had passed back right before he passed, um, you don't get all those subsequent events, or at least not in the order that they ended up occurring. Thank you so much. And I wish we had time to get to all these uh, terrific questions, but um, unfortunately we don't. Um, so we just would like to close asking our panelists um, their thoughts about, you know, given that we talked about all these terrific uh, black pioneers of DC statehood, um, what how do you feel about the importance of Black activists um, being center, uh, you know, being central to the DC statehood movement uh, as we move forward? Um, anybody want to take us, want to start with that? Go well, ahead, Derek. Can I just say one thing before I answer that? And I see that uh, Sammy Abbott's daughter is, is in the chat. I, I know Tina Hobson's in the chat. And a couple of people have asked uh, to donate, um, you know, sort of archival materials. Um, please donate your materials. Uh, the DC History Center has all the DC history papers. Uh, Ann McDonough, wonderful archivist there, has pointed that out, uh, as well as Joe Butler's papers. Um, please donate them there or to the Washingtoniana Room or the MLK Library, because the only reason I know the stuff that I'm telling all of you is because I've been in those archives. And so, you know, you're leaving breadcrumbs for a new generation to continue this fight if we are so unfortunate uh, that we're not successful this coming year. Um, so I just want to point that out, but I'll, I'll leave the question to others. Thank you. Well, um, Joe Biden was um, finished in the presidential primary until uh, Clyburn said, I know Joe, you know Joe, we know Joe, and Joe knows us. And black folks delivered him. 
we have a majority in the Senate now because black folks delivered it. And if we do what uh, Walter Fondre did with Johnny McMillan in South Carolina and, and just go down there in, in the Southland and ask those folks to help, you don't say help, you say help us, help us get rid of or help us do this. Uh, I think we can we can make some headway. Black folks are critical, and um, um, it's been shown throughout history. Thank you, Donny. And Eve, would you like to give a closing comment on that? Yes, I would just like to say the um, my a mentor was Lori Mary, a black mm -hmm. woman from North Carolina. And she is the one who informed me very strongly that you all are not doing anything new. You're just following what we were doing in North Carolina, getting uh, Johnny Mac out of office. And she went down there to get Larch Faircloth, who, who, uh, who led the control board, created the control board that uh, enslaved DC. She went down there on the bus with her huge free DC sign. And I will never forget her. She was dedicated to liberation and freedom. Thank you, Anise. Okay, everybody, I hope, uh, first of all, thank you for being here, all of you. I hope you all have enjoyed learning about the history of the DC statehood movement. I hope that it enriches your experience being part of this movement. It certainly has for me. If you are not currently engaged with the stated movement, please get involved. Uh, a big day is coming up. Uh, the a hearing on the new statehood bill in the House Oversight Committee on March 11th. Um, there are a number of membership organizations that sponsor this event that can keep you updated on um, on plans for that hearing. I'm going to drop a list of those groups in the chat here. So please look them up and get involved. Uh, I want to give a big thank you to our wonderful artists, Lucy Murphy and Razi Caprice, our wonderful panelists, Derek Musgrove, Carolyn Nicholas, Michelle Tingling Clemens, Johnny Barnes, Anise Jenkins. And again, a, a, a great thank you to Mr. Chuck Hicks, all our wonderful sponsors, and to all of you for joining. So we have a great night and see you all at the next statehood event. All right. All right. Good night. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Bye, 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 everybody. Bye, bye, everybody. Bye. Keep up the good work.